1 Samuel 5, 1 up to 12 to introduce who has come to the church. After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it to, from Ebenezer to Ashdod. They, then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it before Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose up early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of Jehovah my God. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. Meaning they said this must be a mistake. Accident, coincidence. They put him back. And then he says, they took Dagon and put him back in his place. Verse 4. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord Jehovah. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained as a stump, in other words. A stump. No head, no hands. Only that remained lying there. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor the others who entered Dagon's temple in Ashdod do so. First Samuel 17.54 He says, David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem and put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. Now I go to First Chronicles. Then I will explain. 10.10 10. He says, They put his armor in the temple of their gods and they hang up his head in the temple of the God. Let me explain together. Now, at that time, at that time in that area, in that whole region, Philistine and everywhere there, whenever people went to battle, People went to war to do battle. Those principles still apply today a little bit. Follow me on this. They go to battle and when you scored victory, triumph over your enemy, you slaughtered. You slaughtered the heads. That's why today is called head count. In today's battle, language is called head count. Meaning, how much did you afflict? How much damage did you afflict on the enemy? It's called head count. But at that time, they literally cut heads and paraded and counted. So, when people went to battle, the symbolism, the symbol, what really represented the victory that this army has called a victory was that they always came back home with the head heads, head put on a sword and lift it like this as a trophy at that time as a trophy so they always had the head and they went to the, it's called the victory camp. Their victory camp, so they celebrated there. So, there was a battle. The Philistines fought with the Israelites. And when they fought with the Israelites, and I'll explain to you the reason why, why this really happened, because in front i'm going to open it better as i deal now with what the visitation is saying to the church in namibia and globally when they went to battle they were told to always put the ark of god in the front line the ark of jehovah always had to be in the front line for victory so the lord may fight their battles and you and I know that only Jehovah is enthroned on the mercy seat. So you can imagine the ark of God was here. Only Jehovah rests and sits on the mercy seat, enthroned. 
So you can imagine there is more that was not revealed here. The ark was here. And when the ark is there, the two cherubim of glory were here. Hallelujah. And so, when they went to battle with the Israelites, for some reason, which I'm going to explain subsequent, please hold it. Hold your peace. They beat the Israelites and confiscated the ark. The Lord allowed it. I will explain later. What the priests did for the Lord do so. So, they took the ark of Jehovah. Can you imagine? The ark of the God of Israel. Where the Lord descends and sits. And they said that they themselves had their own God called Dagon. At that time, in that region, Dagon was a very superior God. With big demands. He had so much demands of sacrifice and what. He was very demanding. They feared him. You remember Baal? Baal was actually the son of Dagon. A child of Dagon. So you can imagine then how much Dagon was revered. And yet, they had also heard about the God of Israel. How mighty he is. And the things he has done there. So they take the ark of the God of Israel and they say, no, let us go and put this ark next to to our superior God called Dagon and see who will win or we can worship both. Double worship. Double. Double worship both. It is now coming to an end in this city. Yes. If Jesus be God, you will worship Jesus. And if immorality is your God, please, you will turn around and we'll let you to go worship immorality. We will make a choice now. So, he came. They put the ark of my God, can you imagine? Next to an idol called Dagon. Day one, my God, he pushed him. He went down. Yeah, he went down. He was a superior God, but he went down. All other gods must bow down. Listen to this now. They thought something was not right. He was not well positioned. It was accidental or whatever. So they put him back. They put Dagon back. The next morning, when they came, that night, there had been a battle. Hallelujah. That night, there had been a battle. And so my God, because he is the most high God, the most powerful God, I am happy I'm worshipping this type of God, who is more powerful than all other gods combined together. He pushed a God and stepped on the head and he cut the neck. He cut the neck. But when he cut the neck, he said, even the head, I chop off. Dagon remained a stamp fallen. Ah. The Lord is coming to Namibia. Now I have told you with my prophetic tongue what he's coming to do. The one of witchcraft that has disturbed for so long, he will simply push and step on the head and he will take the sword and cut the neck and take the head to heaven as a trophy. He will take the head to the victory camp. A stump remained. Ah, because I looked at your church. 
And I asked myself, even yesterday when he took me around, I said, for how long will they do this double worship? You can imagine even showing me that paper bag full of money. And that, they, they, I think they froze. They froze the alcohol. They, not freezing, they cooled it because he talked about a freezer. And he poured. And one of them is saying, oh, it's too early for us to drink. But they poured. And those are pastors. And then they were removing money. I think photographer, what, what. There was quite a bit of a situation. They, they rather if an event they had set up they were in the midst of their excesses now that kind of God will now be brought to the sword to the sword to the sword because Jehovah alone is God hallelujah so can I now give you the message to the church now that I've identified who is coming who has visited the house now listen beloved when the godhead visits i have taught it again and again and again that whenever the lord visits does something or speaks the bible the bible the bible is the reference you must find it in the bible and when you find it that is where the message is and so I want us to slowly go to the Bible. If you look at the Bible, before we go there, if you look at the Bible, in the Bible, you see a similar visitation. And in that Bible, this visitation in the Bible, there is a servant of God there that is synonymous with this visitation. Step by step now. And that servant of the Lord is called Moses, the friend of God. I shared yesterday that when the Lord was calling me in Israel at Mount Carmel, he took me before his throne and he brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord at the throne. Okay, the, there's a whole story. There is the golden walkway, the strips, the reddish brown strips, two of them, both sides. Then the, then the yellowish rich gold. And then now the throne position and the cherubim of glory carry the ark and like this and their heads about and actually they walk sideways so there's a whole narrative i think it's on the web so at the throne room when the lord was calling me he the, the cherubim brought the ark the ark of the lord and they placed at the throne position and then at that place on this side next to the mercy seat was seated moses the friend of god And on the same side, next to Moses, was seated Elijah, the terrible, terrible prophet of the Lord. And alone on, alone, alone on this side, in fact, later I asked the Lord, why was Daniel sitting alone there? Alone on this side was seated Daniel, the terrible prophet of the Lord, the lions cannot eat. So, like that. And then he that was speaking with me there asked me to pray. And then I prayed, and then and I said those things, and then the cloud of glory came through the walkway. Came and sat on the mercy seat like this. Beyond this, I have never shared. There's so much that happens there by voice and visual. But then the voice says, Now I have my four prophets here, and you are the fourth prophet. And then the bed, and then he said, and power has been given to you. And power has been given to you. And the bed, the bed where I was sleeping, physically, physically, shook, boop, boop, physically like this. And, I, and then I jumped up. And I checked the time. It was exactly 3.26 a.m. in the morning. There is a servant of God in the Bible. Ever since then, the things about these th three prophets are happening in this ministry. And power has been given. When he said power has been given, when I woke up, I began to know everything going to happen on the earth ever since then. Across the world. There is a servant of the Lord seated here called Moses whose life and ministry is synonymous with this. 
Moses the friend of God. And so I want us to slowly walk in there and see what message the Lord is giving to the church in Namibia. I want us to begin right from nativity. The book of Exodus chapter 2, beloved, step by step, it will go, it's going to be very powerful here. So Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, real quick, and then I'll explain. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him no longer, when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile. The bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. You know who that is, right? Miriam. Yeah, we'll continue. Verse 5. The Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw, she saw a basket among the reeds and sent the slave girl to get it. She opened it and she saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry, compassion for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Verse 7. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, should I go and get the mother? The, get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Verse 8. Yes, go, he, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me. I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to, to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses. Moses. Meaning, I drew him out of the waters of the Nile. Hallelujah. Can you focus on me so I explain something very important here? The servant of the Lord in the Bible, whose life and life's mission is synonymous with this visitation. In other words, whose life and ministry are synonymous with this visitation. His name is Moses. But right from nativity, from birth, you see that Moses is born at a difficult time. At a time when they said, if a Hebrew woman give birth to a son, you must slaughter, kill. So that was really a time of maximum distress. You can imagine a mother carrying for nine months and then when the midwives, the Egyptian midwives come, they murder the baby in your sight. So the servant of the Lord whose life and life's mission, ministry, is synonymous with this visitation. Right from birth, he was born in a lot of distress and the way he survived is nothing short of a miracle of God. In other words, the miraculous rescue of God. Follow me on this now. This is important for the church in Namibia, for the message. The miraculous rescue of God. Because she takes the baby, she first of all receives the same instruction that Noah received. She receives the same instruction that Noah, Noah received. In Spanish, Noah. Noah received the same instruction. And the instruction Noah received was that you build an ark of rescue. An ark of deliverance. And you find Noah being told about the wood and the pitch. To use the pitch to make the water not enter, watertight. This mama, this mama received the same instruction Noah received. Take the papyrus, make a basket, use pitch, make it watertight. And I want to believe she laid some baby shawls and things, soft things also. 
and she laid a baby you remember when noah built the ark in that instruction do you remember that in that instruction immediately noah entered the ark everything about human control was finished you are now in the hands of god pure 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 hands of god now once they entered it was finished and i know namibia is a church that likes human control they really want to be in fact the whole fight here between the lord and the church is control you want to control your destiny your life your things you don't want he's saying when noah entered the ark control was over now you are fully in the hands of the lord when the mother of moses took the baby and put in the ark in hebrew really is the ark the basket ark same word and put in the basket and released the baby was now fully in the hands of Jehovah. why because in that place you hear that when they picked the baby the baby was crying in that place where the baby was crying a snake the many snakes of the nile could have smelled the baby gonna end bite the baby the many crocodiles of the Nile could have had the baby and smelled the baby, go and knock with the nose like this, follow in the water, eat. The hippos. The baby could have flown away with the first flowing Nile. Follow this. There's a very important point I'm bringing to you on this one. And then, when this Egyptian woman, lady, when she sends an assistant, they find the baby. She could have said, ah, this is one of the Hebrew boys. Kill him. Those were possibilities here. But, the most unlikely happens, she sees the Hebrew baby and has compassion about the baby. I just wanted to emphasize to you that the servant of the Lord whose life and ministry is synonymous with this visitation, his own life at nativity is nothing other than the miraculous rescue of God. His own life. In fact, even his name, she named him Moses, meaning I miraculously rescued him from drowning in the rivers of the Nile, the waters of the Nile. I miraculously rescued him from the Nile. Even the name talks about the miraculous rescue of God. And when you look at his mission, his life's mission, so his own rescue, miraculous rescue by God, at nativity was actually foretelling and foreshadowing of his mission like i rescue you i will send you to rescue my people israel in the miraculous rescue of god miraculous rescue and in that mission of miraculous rescue of god this cloud was instrumental he's saying his own life even name at birth the way you see he was rescued they were slaughtering the hebrew boys in fact they lived side by side side by side with the egyptians so when she was pregnant the egyptians saw they saw her so sometimes you know i think a little deep about this could it be that she get, she was because the bible said the egyptian women because the, the, the israelites became swifter now could it be that came out quickly you see that you don't know for the three months his own life speaks about at nativity the miraculous rescue of god and then his life's mission his ministry became the miraculous rescue of god's people israel and this cloud was the instrument now you begin to understand what he has come to do right is somebody with me now Finally, we are beginning to understand what he's coming to do, right? The miraculous rescue of God. From Egyptian slavery, now the cloud came to facilitate, to empower. God himself came. And the Lord is saying, the Messiah has gone to the cross and delivered the church. 
The anointing has come to the church to help her. The Messiah on the right hand side glorified. But then, all of a sudden, the church has gotten her way back. Back to slavery. She's enslaved. The church in Namibia, you know more than... The, me, I know what the Lord shows me, but you know more than I do. What happens in your churches? Right now, the church in Namibia is serving. She's doing time. In the US, they say you are doing time. She's doing time in slavery to sin. Doing time. Serving enslaved to sin. That's why there is no revival and sexual immorality has entered the house. That's why right now, you can literally sit in the church undelivered, undelivered undelivered including the things he shows me but i'm glad today we are addressing them right the king is coming i have never met somebody saying he wants to go to hell right we all want to go to heaven right and then we will address this now because sometimes you know this church is amazing she's serving slavery she brings prophets that will speak sweet things to her flesh ah! i have heard the trumpet of god it's a spiritual trumpet. I have had the voice of God, the throne announcement yesterday. I did it here. The exact rhythm of the trumpet. That is a spiritual voice. You are doing time in the flesh. You are in the flesh. How will you hear the spiritual voice? How? Do you understand why we are addressing these things now? This is a real awakening to the church. He's saying, she's doing time there. And the Lord is saying that help has come help has come and he's saying that now also he has appeared and he has come to do a miraculous rescue of the church from the church oh, you didn't hear me properly <laughs> nobody heard me here today <laughs> hallelujah you must deliver the church from the church Sometimes, you know, when a mother is about to kill a baby, the government or all the relatives can take away the baby from the mother to save the baby. The church must be rescued from the church. Miraculous rescue. But let us go step by step. Now, when the Godhead visits, his glory, this glory can come in different forms. The glory can come, first of all, as a burning, consuming fire, burning bush. The glory can come in several other forms like you saw today, the fire, the burning bush here. Now, let us go step by step and get the message from Namibia, beloved people. Hallelujah. Turn with me now because that was Exodus 2. We go now after birth, miraculous rescue. Now Exodus 3 verses 1 to 4, 1 to 5. So now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb. In Hebrew they say Horeb, but Horeb. They came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Verse 3 says, So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. It's on fire, but does not burn up. Hallelujah. When the Lord, now look at this now. When the Lord saw that he had stepped forward. Look at this now. The Lord waits until he steps. When the Lord saw that he had stepped, he says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him, from within the bush moses 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 twice even me when this cloud appeared at mount carmel that night twice twice it became the classical calling of the prophet twice 
You remember even Samuel? Samuel, Samuel, wise, consistent like that. Moses, Moses. Again, he said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Then the first thing he says, do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you hear him introducing himself. Verse 6. Can I speak about this now? When the Godhead visits, he can come in this form, in the burning flame that you saw visiting Nakuru, consuming fire. And when Moses was busy tending the sheep of Jethro, the father-in-law, his father-in-law, when you tend your father-in-law's sheep, you be careful. He's testing you. Are you a keeper? Are you a keeper? Are you able to keep his daughter? So it's a lot there that we're not talking about. But there's a lot set up there for you. He's tending the sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law, and then in the process, in the places where he used to tend, and you know they do rotation. I be here two weeks, and one week, I leave the grass to grow, and move this other side. So he goes to this place. Probably yesterday he was here, here also. But Moses sees a strange phenomenon in this place. That there is a bush, a green bush. It is on fire. But it seems like the fire does not burn it up. Burn it up. It's not burning up. Then that now catches his attention. So Moses sets out to go check it out. So when he makes the first step out like this to check it out, when the Lord sees that, that first step, then he hear, Moses, Moses. Now God calls him from the burning bush, the consuming fire. And when Moses responds, here I am. Then the first instruction number one, he said, do not come any closer. Restraint. Restraint. He restrains him. When the glory of God the Father comes, the first thing he does to man, to the church, is to restrain. Hallelujah. And I will explain to you why. Restrain. Moses, Moses, here I am. Do not come any closer. Please now don't come. Yesterday you may have been there, walking there. But today, because there is the visitation of the Godhead, please do not. Number two, take off those sandals. Yesterday you may have been walking there with those sandals. But today, please remove them. Why? Because he said, for the place where thou standest has now become holy ground. Hallelujah. Hey! When I look at this visitation, it seems to me more like this is not a Hindu meeting. Hindu. This is not a Muslim gathering. It's not a fish market. It is not a goat and sheep market. This sounds to me more like Christians, followers of Christ, are worshipping the Lord. Amen. So, this visitation to me is a visitation into the house of the Lord. house of the Lord and the Lord is saying Moses Moses do not come any closer first remove those sandals aren't you aware that where you are standing now has become holy ground
And now, if this visitation has beheld the church, has now entered the house of the Lord, then the Lord is saying this. Namibia, Namibia. Pastor, pastor. Do not come any closer now. Why? Because there is a visitation in the house. The owner of the house is now in the house. And he's saying, you cannot, you cannot now come with those sandals here. No, no, not anymore now. He's saying, take off those sandals now. Know ye not? Are you not aware that because of this visitation, the house of the Lord has now become holy ground? Are you not aware? He said, are you not aware? He said, what's wrong with you? Can't you see? Hey! He's saying, yesterday Moses may have been walking there with sandals. It was all right. Nobody rebuked him. But today, owing to the visitation of the Godhead, everything has changed. The whole ground has become holy ground. You are now standing on holy ground. And the sandals of yesterday cannot survive here now. And if you look at the church in Namibia, they have worshipped quite a bit with sandals. The sandals of the nudity of women in the church. It has been alright. They just come and sit there. It's alright. Nobody rebuked them. In fact, the, father, the pastor feared to touch them. Because, you know, they can go away to his enemy's church across the street. They might enter his enemy's church. And then you hear them. They make sure you hear. You hear them doing big projects in your enemy's church. I'll give you some water to drink so that you may not sleep again. I think that will solve it once for all. Because enough is what? Enough. Hallelujah. Pastor, pastor. Don't come any closer. Can't you see that there is a visitation in the house? He said, first remove those sandals. The sandals of the gospel of prosperity. The gospel that says, don't worry about holiness. You can bribe God and get away with it. The gospel of immorality. Where the pastor has to be popular among women in the church. The wife is complaining. Every day. They know when his clothes go to laundry more than the wife does. They know when the car has to be serviced. They know his itinerary more than the wife is crying out. Honey, please don't humiliate us. You promised me. He said, no, I know what I'm doing. Please stay away from this. Hey! The sandals of false prophets. The sandals of the false apostles that are full, full in this land. Some of them came from South Africa, I know. The sandals of short miniskirts in the church. Abortions. Worldliness. He's saying the owner of the house is now visiting the house. And right now there must be reverence. Reverence. Yes, the fear of God must come back to the church, right? If we really belong to the kingdom of God, really, really, 
we must now take up the fear of God. If we want to enter. It is incredible in this land. Popular. Everything goes in the church. He shows me money in the night. Money, big money. The pastor is doing what? And they're drinking alcohol. I don't know why they're drinking very early in the morning. Put in the freezer, fridge, whatever. It's cold. And when you pour it, it was giving steaming, like cold, very cold, frozen. Frozen-ish. The sandals of alcoholism and pornography. The sandals of worldliness. The immoral fashions the boys see out there, they wear. The immoral fashions the girls see out there, they wear. He says, no. Now there is a visitation. Yeah. We must now prepare to go before the Lord. And he's saying that the removal of sandals simply talks about the restoration, the reinstallation of reverence. That we may now know that the house of the Lord is a separated place from common place. Leviticus 10.10 he says, you must distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. So the removal of sandals here talks about restoring reverence again. When you're, you, you don't choose the church to be the place where you're going to commit sin. Now must be separated from common place. Number two, it says that approaching God or appearing before God to worship Him is a high standard. Because yesterday we talked about Exodus 28, Aaron had to get a garment. There is now a standard. The high priest had to get a certain garment and certain bell alternating with pomegranate. So there was a setup to underscore that gravity. Removal of sandals talks about sanctified place talks about consecrated place talks about solemnity gravity respect honor honor you you can list it yourself and the sandals i have enlisted the big ones in this land sexual immorality that you can see even as you drive you don't have to be spoken to the witchcraft and this gospel of prosperity that is killing the church that has brought in the worldliness and corruption in the church the love of money and name it so now when Moses meets the cloud, a shepherd of some earthly sheep, the sheep of Jethro, who is doing a horizontal gospel, horizontal ministry, earthly sheep, when he meets the visitation of the Godhead, all of a sudden, He's turned around and is now a shepherd of the sheep of heaven, the sheep of God, Israel. Are you going to be the first person in the history of the Bible to meet this visitation and remain the same? Absolutely not, right? We may not know what sheep of Jethro you've been shepherding. But the Lord is saying, time out. Now we must begin shepherding the sheep of heaven. A vertical gospel. Connecting them there. Into the kingdom.
Mimi ni mama Ruto kutoka South Pokot ya Barton Village. Okay, she says her name is Mama Ruto from South Pokot, Chaparten Village. Mimi ndiye anataka mali mama Rosa ilifufuliwa. She says she comes from the same village as Mama Rosa who was resurrected. Usiku sasa wakati usiku nilipitiwa simu when she was called on the night Mama Rosa died. Asubuhi sana saa mbili nilifika kwake. On the following day early in the morning at 8 a.m. she went to Mama Rosa's house. Wakati nilingia malangu and she tells us when she approached the door. Nikasikia harufu ufunde. The rotting stench of death hit her. Nilirudi hata nyuma kidogo and caused her to retreat back and out of that room. She went back a bit. And then she asked herself, has she really resurrected? She says the reason why she asked herself that question, has she really resurrected, is because of the stench of death that hit her when she approached the door to the house. And then she went right straight to where Mama Rosa who had just been resurrected a while ago was lying. And then she says she found that Mama Rosa was breathing. But the eyes were still totally white. She says the eyes were very very white. Hata uso uso yake ni tofauti sana kama ya mama ya mwanadamu and then the face was totally different not like any face for a human being na kilimi cha bado ina cha mdomo and then the tongue was still full in the mouth meaning the tongue was swollen hata kuangalia watu angalii and then she wasn't seeing she wasn't seeing people sasa alinuka hiyo siku and then uh, mama ruto tells us that on that day when Mama Rosa had been resurrected on that following morning she was still stinking the rotting stench of death so hata chioni ananuka and the stench of death continued even till evening hata asije kesha ananuka even on the following day now day 2 after resurrection Mama Ruto tells us the rotting stench of death was still there siku tatu ndio alikuwa ananuka So for three days Mama Ruto testifies and says Mama Rosa was still stinking the terrible strong stench of death. She says once again beloved listeners that uh, on Thursday morning that is after Mama Rosa had been resurrected by the mightiest prophet of the Lord on the first day yes she had heard that the mightiest prophet of the lord had said it is well and then she says after the message of the mightiest prophet of the lord had come to that family that it is well on the following day because mama rosa died in the night past midnight so a few hours later at 8 in the morning that is when mama ruto said let me go and see let me go to the house of mama rosa and see she says when she just approached the door to the house of mama rosa Mama Ruto says when she approached the door to the house of Mama Rosa a very very strong stench of rotting dead corpses hit her. Once again beloved people Mama Ruto is saying when she went to Mama Rosa's home Mama Rosa's house on that Thursday morning day 1 at 8 in the morning when she just approached the door to the house of Mama Rosa a very very strong stench of rotting dead corpses hit her and caused her to retreat back and out of that room. And then she asked herself, is it true? Is it true that surely she has resurrected? 
lakini kwa uchasiri ya itiswe nikaenda mpaka sasa nikakuwa na uchasiri lakini ilikuwa imeanuka mapua yangu ilikuwa imechao funde she says she just had to gather some courage really because the man of god the mightiest prophet of the lord had said it is well in order to enter that room otherwise she says the very very strong stench of a rotting dead corpse was too much it was totally overwhelming she couldn't take it she says her nostrils were full of that rotting the strong stench of a rotting dead corpse and then she had to gather she had to, she had to gather some courage to enter that room and to approach mama rosa who was lying on that bed and she says when she looked at mama rosa lying on that bed the eyes were totally white totally white na na kilinde kwa me mdomo and then the tongue was full in the mouth meaning the tongue was swollen uh, mama ruto testifies and says on that day one after mama rosa had been resurrected she was thinking the terrible strong stench of a dead corpse hata chuma ilikuwa nanuka and then on the second day which is friday on the second day after she has been resurrected she was still stinking the terrible smelly stench of a dead corpse <laughs> and then mama ruto says the stench that was coming from her breath the stench was the stench of a dead corpse that was coming from the breath of mama rosa was totally unbearable she says this stench was a terrible very very strong and terrible stench of a rotting dead corpse
Dale.